Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, Kubernetes 1.22 release. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand it over to Savita Raghunathan, James Laverack, and JC Butler of Kubernetes 1.22 release team. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there. It's actually on the right-hand side. And we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, also join our public Slack channel that I posted in the chat to keep the questions going. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct, and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at the at community.cncf.io under online, online programs. They are also available via your registration link and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist on the CNCF channel. With that, I will hand it over to Savita, James and Jesse. Hey, thank you so much, Libby. Um, and thanks for having us. Uh, we're really happy to be here to talk about the Reaching New Peaks release, Kubernetes 122. Uh, my name is Jesse Butler. I served as the comms role uh, lead for 122, and I'm joined by uh, James, who is the enhancements lead, and Savita, who was our release team lead. Um, this was uh, my first experience in the release team. It was pretty fantastic, I got to admit, and uh, I loved it so much I jumped into 123 I'm working on the docs team. So um, we can take a look at the agenda. We're just um, this. This webinar follows the same structure. So uh, for those of you joining us from watching previous release webinars, you'll be familiar. Uh, first, we're going to start with sort of a sneak peek at what's coming in 123. And then we're going to um, talk about some of the 122 highlights, um, the theme and some of the, the bigger um, uh, feature releases, sorry, <laughs> blanked on that word. Uh, and then the bulk of the presentation in the session is going to be uh, going through the feature uh, and enhancements updates for each of the SIGs. And we will leave some time for Q&A, but uh, if you have any questions that come up during the session, uh, we'll be in the chat and we'll be happy to talk with you. Uh, so with that, I'd like to pass it to James to take over and start talking about the 123 release updates. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Um, so mu much like yourself, I'm actually on the 123 release team as well. Enjoyed, enjoyed the process so much, went back and did it again. Um, so it's going to be great fun going through this process again. Um, the 123 release is currently in progress. We are about halfway through at this point. We started uh, back at the end of August, and we have already passed the first big big milestone, which is enhancements freeze, where we confirm which enhancements are actually going to make it into the release subject to further deadlines. Um, code freeze is approaching pretty soon. It's only only a, a little while away. So we're going to be um, seeing thing kind of activity picking up then. And we are aiming presently for a release on Tuesday, the 7th of December. Um, one important thing to note with 123 and with 122 as well, actually, is that the Kubernetes project has adopted a slightly longer release cycle. So the release cadence has changed from four releases per year to three releases per year. As such, Kubernetes 123 is scheduled to be the last release of 122, with 124 scheduled to begin in January next year. Um, and with that, I think that's all I had to say about um, the upcoming release. Of course, look out for this uh, this webinar again for 123 sometime in January or February next year. And with that, I'll hand over to Savifa to talk about 122. Thank you, James, and thank you, Jesse. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, a little bit about the uh, theme and the logo for the release. So the theme of the 1.22 release is reaching new peaks and related to the entire release team and the contributors of the Kubernetes community in whatever form that you might have contributed by reporting an issue, a bug, fixing something, creating features, providing review, marketing. Anyway, this logo is dedicated to you. Um, uh, we, uh, so this is like a remembrance and kind of motivation uh, through the tough times amidst the pandemic and the constant burnout and everyone uh, moving and taking up new uh, opportunities their way and uh, a lot, lots of struggle over the past two years, but still the community came together and we did deliver something really awesome. There was a lot of chaos, but this is like till date the biggest release like we had 56 enhancements ship in this release and uh kudos to everyone who worked on it um to talk about the logo a little bit um the logo is designed by my good friend boris zodkin and uh, he uh, i just told him the vision about having a mount rainier and the backdrop with the kubernetes flag and the milky way and everything and he just brought everything to life it looks really beautiful and uh, personally for me whenever i visit seattle mount rainier gives me hope and motivation and uh, i see it that this will help everyone like whenever they look at it they get a little motivation and hope and joy and little adventures and also the achievements i hope Hope at all um, everyone can uh, remember those tiny little things and keep moving on. Um, that's all about the logo and the team. Uh, can we move on, the, move on to the next one, please? Uh, all right. Like I mentioned, uh, this release is like by far the biggest one. Uh, we had 51 enhancements uh, ship in 1.21 and that was the biggest uh, then. And now we have like 56, including three replications. Um, we have like 13 stable enhancements uh, and 24 of the enhancements got graduated to beta. And uh, we also have like a a lot of new features that got introduced uh, in the 1.22 release. I'm sorry about that. And we also have three deprecations. Um, um, the alpha features are super new. And uh, in order to use them, you need to enable the feature gate. And there is a request for the community that I want to put forth. So if we are using it, uh, the Kubernetes uh, uh, contributors in the community is always looking for feedback uh, so that we can actually improve and uh, include the feedback and improve uh, further uh, versions and we could include all those things in the beta, uh, make it stable and then graduate the feature. Uh, so that is a little request uh, from my side. Um, and from our side, from the release team's side. Um, and uh, we are shipping like, uh, so far we have shipped like uh, 10 plus stable enhancements the past two releases and I'm hoping that that will continue in the future releases as well. Um, we do see a uh, healthy uh, backlog of enhancements and uh, there is good flow, like we see things graduating and then things going um, up the ladder. And there is also a cycle of deprecations, which to me feels like Kubernetes as a project is becoming more and more mature. Um, um, can we uh, move on to the next one, please? Thank you. Um, so uh, we do have a lot of features and we have bubbled up a few of them uh, uh, and they are grouped together as the major themes. Uh, it's just uh, not limited to these. We do have a whole lot which we will talk uh, in the later slides, but to just give a sneak peek of what we will be talking about. The first one is server side apply. This uh, feature was since uh, beta in 1.21 and a recent 
recently uh, it went to uh, stable in 1.22. Before this feature, uh, the apply usually uh, did a diff on the client side and then on the server side, and that caused a lot of confusion. And uh, it was not the most declarative approach that you would want. Um, and the state of the cluster, the state of the configuration resources were not maintained properly. And with this feature, it's all server side, and uh, it also uses a new object merge algorithm, and then it keeps uh, track of the field ownership and uh, it runs on the Kubernetes API server. This is like the most um, uh, declarative way to use the uh, apply. And it also helps um, um, the non-client Gale versions and also languages and also like non-kubectl uh, plugins to use apply. Um, so that feels like a huge uh, uh, feature boost to me. And moving on to the next one, uh, everyone, uh, this is a little bit about the quality of service, uh, especially for the memory resources. Whoever has been an administrator or whoever has uh, worked on porting um, applications would know the pain of benchmarking uh, the apps and trying to put them on Kubernetes and all of a sudden, like, it gets killed by OOM, right? Um, that is like the infamous um, uh, infamous uh, bug or like it, it's always one OM one way or the other. That's that's my experience, and I have been uh, I worked as a platform administrator for like four or five years. It comes down to OM. So with uh, Kubernetes initially used uh, C groups V1 uh, implementation, and that didn't um, give enough. Uh, that didn't provide enough ways to. Uh, uh, measure the memory resources properly, and uh, it used uh, memory limit in bytes, and then it used the OM scores to uh, kill the pods whenever an uh, um, OM is nothing but um, out of memory. I think it's out of memory because I've used OM all my life, and I just don't remember what OM is all of a sudden right now. <laughs> it's uh, whenever an out of memory uh, occurs, uh, issue occurs. So it takes these two into consideration, and it kills it off. Um, but with uh, C groups V2, uh, things have been uh, made better. There is guaranteed memory uh, resources whenever it's reserved, which was an issue before, and then um, good uh, way to provision the bustable memory allocation um, and so many other new features um, with um, that um, that went into the 1.22 release. And um, moving on to the next one, it's uh, about security. This has been a long requested uh, feature, one might say. Uh, this is uh, about running the uh, cube uh, ADM control plane in a non-user, um, uh, non-root users. Uh, it improves the overall security. And uh, this feature is off right now. And if you want to use it, you have to remember to turn the um, Kubernetes uh, cube ADM specific rootless control plane feature gate on. And if you have any feedback, uh, do reach out to the, uh, um, I think it's from SIG auth. Uh, we will get to that later. Do reach out to the uh, um, cap owners or just uh, shoot a mail in the Kubernetes Slack and uh, people will be able to read it uh, even in the right direction. Um, next slide, slide please. Thank you. Continuing with a uh, couple more, um, actually three more of the uh, major themes. The first one is like the node swap support. Uh, this was also a problem that I have often seen. Um, whenever there is this Java application that got containerized and then they want to run on the Kubernetes, it takes a lot of startup time and uh, not startup, startup memory resources. And uh, sometimes the containers don't even start uh, because the platform wouldn't have been configured in a way that it has enough resources to start. Or sometimes that you have to over provision just because that uh, Java uh, JMS uh, the uh, Java settings uh, the heap memory takes a lot uh, during a startup. With this feature, uh, the Kubernetes, if configured right uh, by the administrators, it can take advantage of the swap support in the underlying Linux machines. So that actually is a real big deal for administrators or whoever wants to 
pack their uh, uh, pack the clusters well and make sure that there is um, no resource wastage. Um, so uh, that that is that is this is an alpha too. That is uh, it's a new feature. So if you want to turn it on, you have to remember to enable the feature grid. Moving on to the next one, um, I want to give a special shout out to the SIG Windows folks. They have worked really, really, really hard to make sure that all the good features of Kubernetes is also available in Windows. Um, and they also have released uh, a tool um, called SIG Window Dev Tools, and that repo is in um, Kubernetes 6. Uh, it supports like multiple CNIs and can run on multiple platforms. Uh, by platforms here, they mean that uh, like uh, Hyper-V, VirtualBox, vSphere, or any Vagrant compatible provider. And it actually provides sandbox for running the cutting edge Windows features from scratch. And you can do that by building the kubelet on the Windows kubelet and uh, uh, I think they have more instructions on the uh, repo, and I will post a link uh, later in the chat so that uh, folks can take a look at it. Uh, so special shout out to the Windows for SIG Windows folks, and uh, thanks for making Kubernetes available on the uh, Windows side as well. Uh, moving on to the next one, it's all uh, it's again about security. Uh, this is also an alpha feature. And uh, this is uh, basically making the cluster, when you deploy the cluster, make the cluster secure, but sec super secure, um, uh, or maybe secure than how, however it is deployed right now. Um, in order to enable this feature, you have to turn the seccomp default flag in the kubelet configuration. And once that's enabled, it takes a default runtime uh, seccomp profile. Um, and uh, it also assists in preventing some zero days. I don't want to go out on a limb and say like all zero days, so I'm going to be safe and then say like some zero days. Uh, so uh, do give this feature a try. And uh, if you like it, let us know. Um, uh, feedback or welcome again. Um, moving on to sync updates. So, um, what is a SIG? Uh, SIG is like a special interest group within the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem um, of uh, projects. And uh, it's nothing but uh, there are like multiple core components. And there are like, I think, uh, um, verticals inside Kubernetes like storage, network, node, um, auth, security, documentation. So each of them uh, are. Um, each of them are uh, unit on their own and uh, a special interest group people come together and uh, work on improving that little unit and then make sure that it uh, works well with other units too. And there are like multiple work, uh, other different groups called working groups, which can span across the SIGs um, when they want to interact with uh, multiple six it becomes a working group and so on so just that's a little bit background about the sig because so many people hear sig and they don't know what it is so it's like nothing but a special interest group focusing on one little uh, core component of kubernetes um might not be accurate but that is the easiest way that i could come up with so that folks can uh, relate to it in a way um uh, james can you move on to the next slide please Thank you. The first one that we will see uh, today would be a pair missionaries. Um, missionary, next, next slide, please. Um, and uh, the first feature is uh, server-side apply. We have discussed a uh, little bit about it already. Um, the goal was to provide a comprehensive declarative approach uh, to use apply, and this feature delivers it. And uh, the highlight, uh, like I mentioned before, is that it can be used by non go languages and also like non um clients. Um, you can use curl, you can use um, anything like those are non native QCuddle clients. Um, um, next one, please. Thank you. Um, and the next one is warning headers when using duplicated APIs. Um, if you have, if you ever have been a cluster admin um, and your company is supporting uh, 
uh, your company has a product, but that's not Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is just uh, an additional thing that's supporting the major product. You wouldn't have had time to update Kubernetes uh, every release cycle. As much as you would have tried, there are like other objectives. Um, I have been a victim of that. I never got to update uh, the Kubernetes versions. Uh, like on time i was always like two versions behind three versions behind or i was jumping between like two three versions like i'd be on 1.14 and i jump to 1.18 and there was no way to know like what are the uh, APIs that got deprecated what is the way to audit what to do like uh, how to communicate it to the users or are is the platform users are using any of the deprecated api and that they are not catching it so this feature is for that. Uh, um, this uh, actually uh, enables, uh, when, when enabled, uh, it lets the users and the cluster administrators to recognize and uh, remedy the problematic uh, APIs or API, duplicated APIs that they are using. And it can also provide um, uh, auditing information that can be uh, later processed um, into like, uh, you can reach out to the group and say, hey, these are all the rest of duplicated things and we are using it. So it's really, really useful um, for that, in that case. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next one is uh, immutable label selectors for all namespaces. Um, Basically, before uh, this feature was available, the namespace uh, didn't have any identifying um, labels per se, and you need to have a right access uh, to add a label on the names namespace. Um, um, and without the uh, labeling, um, it was very it would have been very hard to apply uh, network policies. And you cannot just group the policies together by telling like exclude these namespaces or include these namespaces because there was no identifying flags before. But with this feature, it uh, by default supports an immutable field um, that uh, label that gets added to the namespace, and then uh, it can be used everywhere, like policies or like um, or back anywhere and everywhere, and it's uh, super easy. And no, the users don't have to have right access uh, to create labels. Uh, that's a win. Uh, moving on to the next one. The next one is about priority and fairness for um, API server request. So the API server has a mechanism on its own to protect itself against the CPU and the memory overloads. Um, it has a unit uh, called max in flight limits, and then um, it uh, puts that resource on uh, mutating and read only request. And there is no distinguishing a distinction between these two um, requests uh, other than like it's mutating and read only. And consequently, there the, the request one of the one type of the request can overload the system while the other is just waiting to be served. Um, this uh, feature, which is beta uh, in 1.22, actually aims at uh, providing uh, protection against the overload and also ensuring there is fairness among the tenants, that not one tenant is getting prioritized over the um, other. And also, uh, in addition to that, uh, as a bonus, it also works on optimizing the throughput. Um, so um, I think it's um, overall a great feature and a much needed one. Um, uh, moving on, the next one, apps, um, James is going to take over. And, I can uh, talk a little bit about SIG apps as enhancements. Um, so SIG apps primarily focuses on changes that, or, or on, the, on features more generally that help people to deploy applications to Kubernetes itself. That's their primary focus. So a lot of the things we're going to see are, are related to that. Um, just as a, as a note, that's uh, feature.kates.io slash link at the bottom there. Uh, if you follow that, in, we'll take you to a GitHub issue, which has a lot more detailed information. So if anyone following along wants to follow along at home or wants some more information, if you just uh, tap on that, that link with the issue number, it can, it can get you some more information. Um, so the first one we're talking about is cronjobs. Uh, of course, cronjobs have been in Kubernetes itself for quite a while. Um, so this isn't adding any major functionality. In fact, this is just upgrading an API. So we're 
um, taking a V1 beta one to a V1. We are us promoting this to general availability. Um, so it's really encouraging to see features that have been around for a while entering this this period of stability. Um, it's quite exciting exciting to see as someone using Kubernetes quite a lot. Um, for pod disruption budget eviction number 85, uh, things are pretty similar. Um, this is a feature that's been around stable for a while. Um, and this is moving the policy v1. So the pod disruption budget, if you're you're less familiar, allows you to um, uh, specify a policy to say if too many of uh, a pod shouldn't be taken down under certain circumstances um, or uh, under eviction. So you can evict a pod instead of deleting it. Um, so it's, again, it's really nice to see this, this stabilize. Um, uh, moving on, daemon set max search. This one's coming in at beta. Um, this it brings uh, daemon sets are a policy, a, a way of deploying applications that allows you to deploy one pod per node as opposed to a a deployment or replica set or stateful set. Um, this actually brings them with parity with features from those other deployment mechanisms in that it has this this max surge feature. And the idea here is that you can say that under certain circumstances, you want Kubernetes to actually have more than one pair node, uh, which is primarily useful in upgrade to avoid downtime. Uh, so this is coming in at, at, at beta, which is really interesting to see. Uh, next, we have a logarithmic scale down coming in at beta again. Um, this one affects replica sets, which is what underlies uh, deployments in, in most cases. Um, the idea is that when a replica set scales down, it needs to decide which pods to remove. And in doing so, it, typically it has always picked always picked the eldest, but there is a change coming to pick um, with some randomness in order to to improve the uh, way that this is done. And the logarithmic scale down, um, changes it so that it will take into account the time which the pods have been running relative to each other logarithmically in terms of choosing the longest to go. Uh, so that's a change that, that's coming in and that can be that can be used using a feature flag at the basic grade. Um, next, we have indexed job semantics. Um, this is a enhancement to the jobs API. So if you create a job, it will create a number of pods to fulfill that job. Um, this allows you or allows a user um, to specify an index for each job that is created. And this is mostly used to solve embarrassingly parallel problems. So if you have a problem and you have a thousand things and each thing you need to process can be done completely independently, then you could launch 100 pods and process 10 things each or or whatever you need to do. And this this indexing mechanism allows you allows the pod to know which number it is. It knows it's pod 50, and therefore it must grab these from the middle, for example. Um, another feature coming up later. Um, staying on the topic of jobs, we have the suspend field. Uh, this has this delightful idea that you can, while a job is running, you can suspend it using the API. Any pods that are currently running will be will be stopped and then at some later date you can come back and resume it this is intended to give greater control for things using the jobs api in order to um uh in order to to manage how it is executed uh again coming in a beta um pod deletion cost this is a another change to make it more flexible in how uh scale down for replica sets works um in particular, this allows a, a annotation to be used to specify the cost in some generic terms of deleting a pod. Um, as before, it, where I said, as I said before, typically it would delete the oldest, but that might not be under some circumstances the cheapest pod to, or the most correct pod to, to remove. So this allows uh, application users to give some hints to the Kubernetes control plane about which pods it would prefer to keep if it has to be scaled down. Um, this again coming in at beta. 
Uh, Job Tracker at Lingering Pods. So this is coming in at alpha. So this, again, is behind an alpha feature gate. Um, this solves a limitation with how, again, jobs are run in the current versions of Kubernetes, where in order for a job to be marked as complete, all of the containers which comprise that job must finish and must stick around. And this is, at worst, messy in not particularly active clusters. But if you had a particularly long running job that required lots of executions of containers and or pods, I should say, and you had a very busy cluster, which had a large amount of churn in pods, you might hit the circumstance where a the earliest pods in the job are, are removed and cleaned up from the cluster before the last ones execute, in which case the the job will not be able to mark itself as completed. This system introduces a new way of tracking completion without relying on those pods being lying around in order to understand that something has, has completed. So this is really an optimization for really high scale use cases. Um, next, we have uh, min seconds and stateful sets. This is another case of different ways of deploying applications being brought into parity. Um, so this is already something you can do on uh, deployments, daemon sets, replica sets, to say that you want to wait for a pod to be marked as ready for a period of time, or marked for the containers in the pod to become ready for a period of time before you consider the whole thing ready. So this is again coming in at alpha, and is another kind of unifying how you can think about applications within Kubernetes. Um, then we have SIG auth, and I'd like to pass back over to Safifa to talk about SIG auth. Um, thanks, James. Um, um, can you move on to the next slide, please? Um, thank you. The first up is external uh, client uh, credential providers. So before this feature, this feature has been in beta for a really, really long time since 1.11, and it finally graduated in 1.22. Before this feature existed, so all the certificate rotation needed a client restart, and there were no support for the standard key management solutions. Um, but with this one, with this feature in, it in addition to supporting the key management standard key management solution, it also supports like token based protocols, and more than that it has made Kubernetes vendor neutral. Uh, recently, the Azure and the GCP plugin has been removed. It also provides a template uh, or like an interface uh, for external providers where uh, they can external um, auth providers, authentication providers, they can just uh, create their own um, uh, um, package separately and that can be easily integrated with uh, Kubernetes. So, um, this feature uh, is uh, decouple a lot of things, and uh, it's a it's a it's it's a win for making Kubernetes interface very neutral. Uh, moving on to the next one, uh, we have a bound service account uh, token values. So Kubernetes uh, provisions. Uh, JSON web tokens for workloads, and uh, this functionality is on by default and widely used. And the um, current, um, the previous, uh, uh, the JWT system had a lot of security issues and uh, also scalability issues. That it re it required a Kubernetes uh, secret per service account, and that was not a scalable option. Security issues like someone gets all of the JWTs, they can just impersonate and. Uh, uh, masquerade as someone else, and uh, so many other things not time bound. Uh, um, so many issues, uh, but with this feature on, it uh, it allows the API to specify uh, like uh, create web tokens that are like audience bound, time bound, and key bound. And uh, this uh, feature also uh, introduces a new mechanism to distribute and support uh, tokens, uh, and also provides backward compa compatibility. Uh, and it is stable now. Um, moving on to the uh, next one, um, it's certificate signing request duration. 
um so basically uh this um uh, this feature helps in uh, providing a new optional field where you can uh, specify the number of uh uh, specify a duration time to uh, for the certificate to be active. Before that, I think it was like an year, and you have to rotate it out every year or something like that. Uh, but now with this uh, feature in beta, it actually um, provides a time-bound certificate. Uh, so certificates. Um, moving on to the next one. PS pod security admission. So this is the most awaited feature uh, after the PSP deprecation last year. This is an alpha. Uh, this as uh, the main motivation of the, uh, this feature is to avoid the pitfalls created by the PSP originally. And uh, it, uh, it does it by supporting multiple uh, modes. And uh, one is called enforcing mode, auditing mode, and the other one is like warning mode. And you can have multiple modes on the same namespace. Uh, and this is enforced through the namespace labels. And the highlight of the feature is that you can also have a dry run flag passed uh, before applying the policy so that, that you will know how the changes would um, affect the existing parts without um, hurting them in any way. Um, so this is the new, this is an alpha flag, alpha feature. So behind the feature gate, and if you want to use it, you need to enable the feature gate on. Uh, moving on to CLI with James. Hey, so SIG CLI, um, as the name implies, CLI stands for Command Line Interface, deals with all of the command line tools which uh, power Kubernetes and which help you use Kubernetes, principally kubectl, but also other tools as well. Um, so the, the one we want to talk about here is uh, kubectl commands in headers. So this is a enhancement to kubectl, where now when it is used, it will send a header to the Kubernetes API server in order to inform it what the original command was. Um, this is designed to help cluster administrators understand how their clusters are being used because this information is collatable and exposable from, from the Kubernetes metrics and logs and other things like this. So they can start to help with debugging and they can help with understanding usage patterns. Um, that's a really interesting one to see come in. And again, that's, that's coming in, in, in beta. Uh, handing back over to Savifa for SIG Cloud Provider. Uh, so the SIG Cloud Provider, uh, next slide, please. Um, so this SIG Cloud Provider uh, plugin has uh, always been an entry, uh, and we are actively working on moving it out of the tree. The entry means that it's part of the core Kubernetes um, code base, which is in KK. And when it moves to out of free, it can live in the Kubernetes ecosystem or it can actually live as an external package. And uh, Seek Cloud Provider has been working on it. And this feature actually helps in migrating the workloads from the older feature to the new external uh, out of three equivalents uh, without having a downtime. Uh, uh, if your system needs to be head if your system needs, like if your cluster cannot, uh, uh, afford any downtime at all, so this feature can be used. But they do recommend that if okay, they do say that you kind of uh, like uh, they recommend that the entry cloud providers be disabled and then deploy their respective or free uh, cloud controller manager when you bring this on. Um, so uh, this is in beta and. Um, uh, it's a uh, uh, they are working um, uh, as much as possible to make it like compatible in the making sure the move is smooth and um, everything for the users. Moving on to the next one, cluster lifecycle with James. Thank you. Uh, so SIG cluster lifecycle, as the name implies, again um, thinks about clusters and how to manage them and how to administrate them going forward across the entire lifecycle of a single cluster, as the name implies. Um, the big change this time is the one we spoke about during the major themes is the ability to run the control plane as a non-root user to increase security. Um, we've already touched this a little bit, so I'm not going to talk about it too hard, but uh, this is coming in as alpha and again requires that feature flag. So it's really exciting to see this from a security point. From a 
Um, moving back to Sarifa for a second, instrumentation. Um, so uh, the next one up is uh, API server tracing. And uh, before, uh, in order to support the large communities cluster uh, without having to create uh, a lot of etcd and keep server replicas, the keep server API contains a cache, in memory cache, basically. And to watch watch cache that uh, has all the request and um if some if there is an any inability to re-establish the um um watch uh, what happens to the cube api server restarts and that causes like a couple of issues uh, like there uh, would not be no uh, there'll be like empty change history and uh, there would uh, the resource version would be like out of uh, the history window in order to avoid um, all those things um, this new feature which is an alpha feature that aims at avoiding these major two pitfalls and make sure that there is a uh, api tracing available even with the cube api server restarting uh, moving on to the next one um, network with james Sure. So SIG Network deals with everything from a service implementation to DNS to CNI plugins um, and, and really covers a wide gamut of what Kubernetes is feature set does. Uh, so one of the big ones we've seen is uh, endpoint slices. Um, this, I believe, entered either stable or beta the last time in 121. Um, so seeing this come and uh, increase uh, approach stability is um, really interesting and and really cool. Um, so this is ordered to, the core idea of a feature is to take kind of load and other issues off the existing endpoint API. Uh, so this is um, and other information, but this allows you to talk a little bit more about the pro that is that is used on a more granular level. Um, so again, seeing this go stable is, is really interesting. Um, service disabling web balancing node ports. Um, this allows you to, if you create a, normally if you create a um, Kubernetes service, it can be cluster IP or it can be um, node port, or it can be a load balancer. And if you create a load balancer, you still get a node port assigned. So this lets you opt out of, of getting that if you don't need it for, for whatever particular reason, depending on the implementation of your load balancer. Um, this is coming in at beta. Uh, next is the load balancer class. So this is a lighter weight approach of um, dealing with load balancers in Kubernetes. Um, so I, I believe this, yeah. So this this um, this is very similar to an API elsewhere that has like a, a gateway class resource and things like this. So again, seeing this coming up beta in part of uh, SIG Network's ongoing, ongoing work in this area. Uh, network policy support port ranges. Um, Pretty simple. You can have a network policy which can lock down uh, communication between pods. And um, this allows you to put a a port range on that rather than a single port, which for certain classes of applications is is really quite useful and really quite interesting to see. Um, service internal traffic policy. Um, so this again addresses certain topologies that you might see in uh, in networking and allows to do things like a node local and uh, other topology aware things. So this is, a, again, to make traffic policy more powerful as a feature set in, in Kubernetes and to address a few more use cases. Um, namescaped scoped ingress class parameters. Um, so this allows you to... <sighs> This allows you to specify more information about how a ingress works at the namespace level. 
Um, so this is again a new beta field. It's really just making breast much more powerful and and easier to use. Um, moving on, uh, graceful termination for the local external traffic policy. Um, this again is just a very simple improvement. It's only at alpha, so again you will need a feature gate in order to properly understand and in order to properly activate this feature. Um, but this is again the big big thing that uh, SIG Network is working on, and it's really exciting to see them bring so much change to the table in this case. Um, and then finally from SIG Network, we have expanded DNS configuration. Uh, so this allows just more fine-grained DNS control. Um, so this allows configuring uh, resolvers with more detail. This allows more search paths, things, things like this. So, you know, it's really great to see this coming in at, at the alpha stage, at least. Um, moving back to Servifa for SigNode. So uh, starting with uh, huge pages, uh, huge pages a memory page that is uh, larger than the size of uh, four kilobytes. And uh, there are certain use cases in the Kubernetes and the applications that needs more than that. Uh, uh, they request uh, more than the normal usual size. Uh, um, so this feature actually uh, supports uh, having a pre-allocated uh, huge pages configured um, on the node by the administrator at the build time. And uh, whenever a pod requests a number of pages, huge pages, uh, it can get scheduled to that particular node and it can already like have an account of like where uh, it can get scheduled and how it can take advantage of the uh, available huge pages. Moving on to the next one. Um, so this uh, is like, uh, th this feature is about configuring uh, fully qualified domain name, has host name for pods. So people who have used uh, servers before communities like Red Hat or CentOS, I predominantly used uh, uh, CentOS uh, and Rail for a while. Um, um, when I was doing a uh, platform administrator and then uh, it actually takes the uh, host name as FQN and uh, up this feature actually enables portability between the older application legacy applications to hosted in the servers before into the Kubernetes uh, platform uh, without having to you know change a whole bunch of things and now uh, the um, part supports F FDQN uh, sorry, FQD, and I'm like, what am I saying? I was like, uh, just uh, interchanging things in my mind. <laughs> so it's fully qualified domain name. That's why I just stick to that. Uh, so the part supports it now, and it's a stable. Uh, it's a stable uh, feature right now. Moving on to the uh, next one is about sizable memory bagged volumes. So Kubernetes supports uh, empty data volumes whose uh, backup storage is uh, basically memory, and that is like 50% uh, of the memory on the Linux host. Um, so this prevented the parts from uh, uh, getting ported from one node to another when they had to, because they're already like depending on the uh, memory on the host that was hosted. But with this feature, uh, the portability between the uh, portability of parts between the nodes has been uh, increased, and it also allows uh, minimal uh, memory configuration in addition to an um, explicit optional user provided. By Value. So this uh, actually helps in scheduling as well as like porting it from um, like when one node uh, had to be like drained and code on as we, the parts need to move to the new one, it can um, easily do. Um, moving on to the next one is ephemeral container. So everyone uh, uh, who has been working on uh, with applications um, using Kubernetes, um, would have come across a point where you wanted to debug. And the one way to do is like a uh, uh, as exec. And then you get in the pod and you run as a process within the pod. But this feature is in beta and it lets you uh, create an ephemeral container that attaches um, to the pod and uh, you can do all the troubleshooting and debugging um, uh, within the container. Um, yeah, moving on to the next one. 
liveliness pro uh, grace seconds um so um before this feature existed, the liveliness props uh, used a termination grace period seconds uh, for the normal shutdown and whenever the prop fail, fail. So if the uh, termination period that was held was long and then the liveliness prop fail, the workload uh, was not start restarted because it was actually waiting on the full termination period. In some cases, uh, this does not uh, the uh, actual, uh, like th this caused like delay in things and this was not like, there were like different use cases uh, which can be seen in the cap uh, link uh, mentioned in the slide, uh, use stories. Um, so this uh, feature actually supports setting an optional prob uh, termination grace period seconds. When set, it actually uh, ignores uh, the uh, readiness probes and then the part can be terminated um, without having to go through the full uh, wait time. Uh, this uh, feature is in beta right now. And uh, if you're interested in more uh, details, please click on the links in the slide, which will be available later. Moving on to the rootless mode containers. So this is one of the highly um, wanted features to avoid a container breakout and not uh, have root access uh, practically. Uh, thereby exploiting everything. So this feature is an offer. And when the feature is enabled, it uh, lets you run the uh, components in the user namespace. Uh, this is a really uh, important uh, security feature uh, available right now. Um, and um, take advantage of it. Uh, if you like to keep your cluster secure. Uh, moving on to the next one. So C groups V2, um, Kubernetes initially was implemented with the C groups V1 version. And uh, recently the C groups V2 in the kernel uh, went stable a couple years ago, I think. Um, and since then, most of the distros have started supporting C groups V2 as default, uh, thus preventing uh, Kubernetes, which is using C groups V1, um, uh, working in the intended way. So this is basically adding the support to uh, support the Kubernetes uh, platform to support C groups V2, which is already supported in the kernel. Um, it's an alpha state. And if you want to use it, please take advantage of enabling the feature gate. And the next one is the memory QoS with uh, C groups V2. We discussed a little bit about it in the major themes. Uh, so this uh, is nothing but it adds additional support memory QoS with uh, uh, taking advantage of the C groups uh, V2. Um, moving on to the next one. Um, no system swap support. We talked a bit about it um, already. Um, it's uh, mainly for a uh, certain type of applications and it also can take advantage of the um, Linux system swap, um, which uh, when this, this feature is now found and enabled in it, the containers, uh, the parts can take advantage of this too. Um, moving on to the next one is enables a comp by default this is addition this this is something we talked about earlier as well this is another security feature which is an alpha state and uh, uh, when enabled it makes um, communities uh, secure uh, more secure um, by default um, moving on to the next one uh, is a uh, CPU manager pol policies and um, what it, um, what this feature is about the um, the uh, the CPU isolation is available uh, but some of the uh, applications might uh, 
use a uh, simultaneous multi-threading uh, enabled system and they want to take advantage of thread level allocation as well and that is what this feature supports and it is an alpha state uh, again um, if you want to use it the feature gate needs to be enabled and more details can be found in the links provided in the slide if you are interested moving on to the next one scheduling with james hi yeah. um so with six scheduling uh we have a couple of issues to talk about um the first enhancement is scheduler component config api um this allows cluster administrators to more fluently express the configuration for various scheduler components so this is a beta iteration um and some plugin uh, additional plugin in uh, additional plugin functional functionality um so again it's going to be interesting to see this in beta and it's going to be interesting to see where we go with this this feature uh next we have prefer nominated node um this can speed up scheduling and eviction if you're scheduling a lot of pods at the same time principally um by uh, um, allowing pods to nominate a node that they particularly prefer and then the scheduler will try its its best to get you there but no guarantees of course uh next we have namespace selector for pod affinity um so this allows pod anti-affinity to work without knowing the namespace's name ahead of time so this allows you to use labels or what point principally labels on namespaces in order to select them for affinity and anti-affinity um and then finally from this sig we have the single scoring plugin for node resources um so this is a change which improves the complexity of the kubernetes source code um well improves it by reducing it in order to allow um to compress a couple of ways of talking about scoring uh node resources um into like one one format um moving back to Zvifa, we have six storage so first up with uh, six storage is a csi service account uh, token um, so this uh, feature is stable right now and it provides uh, a service token for the parts that the csi drivers are mounting the volumes for and uh, the tokens are actually valid only for like a limited period of time and this uh, feature also enables the csi drivers uh, uh, th this feature actually provides an option to the CSA drivers to uh, re-execute the uh, no publish volume to mount the volumes back again. Moving on to the next one is um, volume populator data source redesign. Um, this feature is an alpha. This is um, nothing but a major redesign of the data source. Uh, it previously only allowed uh, two types of um, data source uh, references one for the existing pvs to take the uh, to take clone of the volume and then another for the snapshot to uh, like um, if you want a restore uh, for the intent of restoring uh, basically and it didn't have any other options uh, before to um, add any other data sources um, with this design, it provides uh, expanded semantics, um, and it also adds a new data source difference field, which can uh, which provides uh, options to add uh, more data resources uh, other than the existing PVCs and the snapshots. Moving on to the next one is. Uh, Delegating FS group to CSI driver instead of Kubelet. So currently for most of the volume plugins, Kubelet applies an FS group of ownership and which means that uh, permission-based changes that it's gonna recursively uh, change ownership and change the mode of the files and in directory inside the volume and this is not applicable for all the csi drivers for example azure file does not support uh, ch mods or ch own so uh, when this uh, feature is um, enabled which is an alpha state uh, so there is an explicit field that can be added to the csi driver and that can be applied during the mount time 
Moving on to uh, RWO pod access mode, read only, read write only pod access mode. So this is a new mode uh, in addition to the existing read write once mode, which actually uh, says the single node uh, can mount the volume. Uh, but any like the volume is just attached to the single uh, one particular node, but all the parts in the node have access to that. But with the new feature, which is like read, write, read, write one spot access mode, uh, it's like a single one to one relationship. Only the pod, single pod on the single node, like whatever node it is on, have access to that particular volume on, and nothing else have rewrite um, access to it. And this feature is alpha again. Moving on to Windows with James. Hi. Uh, so with SIG Windows, uh, first of all, we have CSI plugins for Windows. Uh, so CSI is container storage interface. These plugins are going stable in 122. So again, this is part of the thing we were talking about, about Windows support gaining a lot of parity with, with Linux support and Kubernetes. So really exciting to see this stabilize. Um, next, we in alpha, we and our final uh, enhancement that we're talking about today um, is Windows Privilege Containers. Um, so this has is the idea that you can launch a privileged container on on Windows, which previously you were unable to do, um, typically for configuring networking or storage or some other thing that requires privileged access. Um, and this is coming in alpha. And with that, I think we are done talking about every, just about every enhancement in, in Kubernetes 122. Uh, I'd like to pass back over to Savifa to talk about the uh, release team shadow program. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, oh, there was a huge list of enhancements that we went through. Um, and um, super like speed. I feel like that we just ran through it. Uh, moving on to the uh, release team shadow program. Uh, we wanted to uh, talk about uh, like uh, what is to be a part of the release team and there are like oh, what is the release team and uh, uh, what do we do there and um, um, how to apply or how to be a part of it. Basically the release team uh, is there to facilitate all the uh, enhancements, the feature duplication that goes in the release. Um, we are just there to help the contributors and uh, help them the process and everything so that, that whatever they are working um, on gets into the release. Um, in order to do that, we have various sub teams within the release team itself, um, starting with the enhancements. Enhancement team keeps tracks of whatever the feature that is going into the release and the CI, CI, CI signal team tra uh, keeps track of the stability of the uh, release um, in a way that they keep watching for test flakes and make sure that all the tests pass and it's healthy uh, and gives signal for the release. And goes to bug triage, they keep a, a, a track on the um, critical bugs that got opened again to release and uh, help coordinating with, coordinating with the contributors and the SIGs so that they can be closed and making the release more stable and reliable. Documentation team helps with coordinating between the enhancement owners and if their feature needs new docs or like updating the existing docs, they help with the coordination. Then comes the release notes team. They help in automated generation of the release notes, the features that's going on in the release, just not the feature, bug fixes and anything and everything that goes in the release basically. That needs a release notes. They keep uh, track of it and help uh, coordinate it. Then comes the uh, communications, communications responsible for a lot of things, uh, uh, starting with coordinating the release uh, within the Kubernetes community with CNCF, um, setting up the sub, um, this webinar, and uh, making uh, keeping a track of all the feature blog that goes after the release that has um, successful release. Uh, they. Uh, coordinate, uh, they work with the uh, owners of the blog and make sure that it gets published. 
so they help with everything and release lead team helps all the sub team uh, and also works uh, with the contributors and radio six um, uh, wherever uh, some kind of help is needed and making sure that the release is on track and uh, it uh, goes out the door successfully so what's special uh, it's like if you're a newbie uh, and you don't know anything about Kubernetes and you want to be a part of uh, like to know what, what to do, where to start and uh, how things um, happen in a big project like Kubernetes, uh, it's a great place to learn and you can apply to be a shadow. You are a beginner or you already participate in a SIG but you want to expand your knowledge, uh, it's again a great opportunity. And if you are a, uh, like a really advanced contributor, and you want to act as a liaison between the SIG, your SIG and the release team, there are opportunities for that as well. So you can uh, ensure that whatever the feature your SIG is working on gets like, you can you can uh, be the person um, who can help the release team understand what's going on and also like who can help the SIG understand like, oh, these are the deadlines and we need to get things done by this time. So it could be that. So the shadow program is for everyone who wants to learn and uh, develop their uh, knowledge around the ecosystem or get started um, um, or even to try something out new. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that it has gotten very competitive over the years so don't be disheartened uh like last time i think james we had like what uh, for 1.23 james is in release team lead and i think they had over 180 applications for 40 roles not 40 like what 35 uh yeah so i'm released lead shadow for for 123 um uh we had i believe 185 ish applications and we were able to take on i think about 26 shadows i want to say something like yes. that so it, it's getting very competitive but that is not the only way to help out so if you are uh interested in helping out there are like a lot of ways come say hi and um reach out to folks uh start contributing the new uh, like uh good first issues um and uh, work on area, improve your skills, reapply. Um, and you can learn more about the release team, the links uh, mentioned in the slide. Uh, there are like various, the roles that we talked about, uh, We there is a role handbook, so you can go and take a look at it. And um, let us know if you have any questions about that. And uh, we are super sorry that uh, we are way over time and uh, apologies for the inconvenience and thank you for staying with us um thank you james Jesse, libby and uh, all the audience who are here uh, with us listening to our session um please, please feel free to ping us uh in the slack if you have any questions and i think libby already shared the slack channel if not please correct me um yep i'll and, share it again uh, right now Thank you, Libby. Thank you all um, so much. What a great presentation. Um, and thank you for your time and everyone else as well. And here is the Slack channel once again. All right. Well, with that, we will let everyone go and follow up on the Slack channel. And all of this will be online in just about an hour or so. So. You can rewatch and get all your questions answered. Thank you both so much. And we will see you all again next week for another live webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.